today we are joined with Father Calloway from the Marians of the Immaculate Conception uh, Order. And Father Calloway is well known um, and also the vocations director. Uh, so we're, we're very, very pleased that uh, you, you gave us your time for this next 45 minutes to an hour. Um, yeah. Today, the, the main purpose of this was Father Calloway, we, we just want you to help us grow into a devotion, a strong devotion to St. Joseph. And we know that you just wrote a book, uh, I think that was released in January, from, uh, and I think it was um, Mary Press that was the publisher of it. Um, but we were just wanting, again, just to, to grow in love to, of St. Joseph, and we thought that you're the man for the job. Uh, <laughs> no pressure. <laughs> yeah, no pressure. No pressure. Um, but uh, so, you know, just like one one question that, that I did have is, you know, I guess, why is it important to grow in a devotion uh, to St. Joseph? Mm. Well, I mean, I think it comes back to just wanting to imitate Jesus because, you know, he technically didn't need uh, Joseph. Technically, he didn't even need Our Lady. I mean, he could have come into the world out of the heavens already as a 33-year-old man. He's God, right? He can do this. But he humbled himself and he placed himself under Mary and Joseph. And in his humanity, not in his divinity, in his divinity, he doesn't need anything. But in his humanity, he grew up like every other child does. You know, he, he developed and he learned things, even though he's the maker of the cosmos and the heavens and the angels. But he was so humble that he learned things from his mom and his dad. And I think that that points something important to us about having a relationship with Mary and Joseph as well, because, you know, we, we say that Mary is the mother of Jesus, and this is true. She's also the mother of the church, which means us, right? Well, it's the same thing with Joseph. He's the father of Jesus, not biologically, of course, but... He's also, in some sense, the father of the church. That's why we call him the patron of the church. Patron comes from the Latin, which means pater. It means father of the church. So if we're going to be like Jesus, let's place ourselves under the care of Mary and Joseph. And in these crazy times that we live in, where there's so many misunderstandings about fatherhood in particular, mm -hmm. I think this is why the Holy Spirit is now telling us, now's the time of St. Joseph. Now's the time to get to know him, love him, and and run to him, go to him, because he's going to teach you important lessons that um, you need for for our difficult times. Yeah, that, you know, there was a quote by I think it's Saint Bernard, and I got pulled here, and I like this quote. It was, "Power is given in some of the saints to help in particular necessities, but to Saint Joseph, power is given to help in all necessities." I mean, so that to me is just, I mean, his 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 power is much much greater, yeah. um, and it is it, it's it's. Un, I don't even know if it's not unusual, but it's uh, that, you know, this is the, the, the year of St. Joseph. Do you know how does that come about and what is the significance of that? Like, what does that what does that mean? Yeah. So we've never had one before. We've never had in the 2000 years of Christianity a year of St. Joseph. So this is extraordinary. I mean, what we're living in right now. Oh, my. What St. Bernard of Clairvaux or St. Teresa of Avila or St. Andre Bessette, right, lo who loves St. Joseph, what they would have done to have been privileged to live in a time like this. Well, what it means for us is we're gonna have special uh, celebrations in honor of St. Joseph. There's gonna be talks, conferences, many dioceses are gonna set up maybe a, a particular pilgrimage site. Maybe it's just simply a parish named St. Joseph where people can go and there'll be indulgences given. There'll be uh, special masses said. Uh, priests will focus their attention and their homilies uh, a little more towards St. Joseph and these themes. So. We're talking about a, a, a great gift for us to help us renew families, because we all know families are, are a mess these days. There's a lot of, a lot of turmoil out there, a lot of confusion, mm -hmm. a lot of division, and to help us renew the church and parishes, you know, the family of God. Got a lot of confusion and division in the church as well. So yeah. we've got to bring in, uh, bring in the big guns, bring in dad, <laughs> and uh, help them uh, get some get some order in this chaotic household. <laughs> yeah. You know, there, there was I was watching one of your videos last night and um, you had commissioned what looked to be one of the greatest images of St. Joseph. And if I wish we had a we could put this on the screen somehow, but mm -hmm. we should probably link to it in the, in the description. But it is oh, what a manly figure he was, um, or at least within that within that image. And I think what you said was in that image, he was essentially saying enough is enough. 
you know, that he was he was firm. Um, yeah. And I feel like we're we're kind of at that point right now. Uh, maybe yeah. we've been at that point for a really long time, but uh, yeah. yeah, what a, what a great uh, what you know what what a what it it's a beautiful thing that is the 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 year of Saint Joseph. For many it is, and that's one of the some of the commissioned art that I did for the book. Um, that one in particular, I just thought that we needed a a stronger presentation of Saint Joseph. One that is of course loving and and all of that, but that so he's holding the Christ Child in his arms. But he's got that one hand up, and, and there's no words, of course, there's no bubble next to his face. But you don't need a bubble because when you look at it, you 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 know he's saying, "Knock it off, like yeah. stop." Um, and I got that. I modeled it after in Rome at uh, Santa Maria Maggiore, the Marian Basilica. There, there's a statue of Our Lady holding the Christ Child, and she's got her hand out, like basically the same thing, saying "stop." Um, so I said, "We need a Joseph image like that." And what's really cool is I had the artist put the lily of St. Joseph in the hands of the Christ child. And it became like a lily staff, like a, a, a lance. And Jesus, the child Jesus is stabbing a, 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 a dragon at their feet with Joseph's lily. I just thought, wow, that's, that's <laughs> awesome. <laughs> that is awesome. Actually, that was one question I had was, uh, so you, you know, there's also images like, uh, like this one. I don't know if you guys can, can see that. Uh, this is, uh, but you know, Saint Joseph is is depicted as an, an older man as well, and I always am confused between young and old. And just in my head, in terms of how I, I rationalize it, is that you know, if him leading Mary and Jesus into Egypt. I mean, you know, a seventy year old man is going to have a tough time doing that. So yeah. in my mind, I always pictured Saint Joseph as more to to what you had in your art. But is there? I'm just wondering, like, what was the tradition, you know, what has the church taught about this? Why did it, you know, why is he depicted as being older? And also about the the lily. Maybe you can talk about what the significance of that, because I've recently learned that. I mean, I've yeah. seen so many pictures of St. Joseph, but I never yeah. understood why is, why are you holding a lily? Uh, yeah, so the whole, you know, the, the, the church has no official teaching whatsoever on the age of St. Joseph. A lot of people, because artwork has depicted him as old, have just assumed that, well, that's, that's like the catechism. We got to, you know, no, it's not. They only were doing that because they thought, well, we want to protect the virginity of Mary. We don't want anybody thinking that Joseph, you know, uh, had bad intentions with Mary or that they were, you know, it, it engaged in the marital act because we know that they did not. So therefore they depicted him as old to show that. But I mean, you don't have to be old to be, you know, chaste and to actually it takes a young man more virtue because his, his pistons are firing, you know, so he's, he's right. got to be in charge of all of his stuff, whereas an old man really, it, it's kind of waning. So this is where I get a lot of quotes from like a Venerable Fulton Sheen, mm -hmm. Mother Angelica, St. Jose Maria Escrivá, mm -hmm. and many others who talk about, in all likelihood, he was a lot younger than he's been depicted in art throughout the centuries. Um, probably not the same age as Mary. Most people think she was probably around 16 or so. He probably wasn't 16, but he certainly wasn't twice or three times her age. Let's say maybe he was in his 20s or mid to late 20s or something, you know, something like that. Um, because you're right, all the walking that he was required to do, I mean, think about this is biblical. He had to walk to Jerusalem three times a year. Um, and let's, let's just say that he did that for 30 years, just throwing it out there. If you do the math from Nazareth to Jerusalem, it's a three day journey one way, add that up times 30, he basically walked three fourths of the way around the planet during his life. I mean, that tells you right there <laughs> that Lily was not the cane of an old man. It was the staff of a spiritual warrior. It was a man who, you know, was, was a protector, a defender, a provider. And that's a big part of the Lily is for Joseph. It also has come to represent in a huge way and primarily so his purity. So that's what the lily signifies in, in icons and art, Catholic artwork. And certainly he was pure. And um, so that's what, that's what that signifies. And that's why almost in every image, statue or painting you see of him, he'll have that lily. Okay. So, you know, we, uh, I mentioned the book being published in, in January. Um, and when you were doing the research for that book, what were three, was there, I wrote down three surprising facts about St. Joseph that you found during the research and maybe things that like 
yeah, just were not uh, or that are not commonly understood or that yeah. people might not know. Like what would be three things or maybe just one, what, you know, whatever, but you know, what, what yeah. did you learn that was surprising? Yeah, I'll, I'll give you three things um, just quick on each one. But um, so the wedding ring that Joseph gave to the Blessed Virgin Mary at their betrothal um, is still in existence. It's housed in a gigantic wow. reliquary in the cathedral in Perugia, Italy, which is only like 30 miles from Assisi, but it's still there. And people go there and venerate it. Couples uh, who are engaged or married, they're able to take their ring and touch it to the wedding ring. Wow. It's called the San Santo Anello in Italian. I mean, this is extraordinary. I, yeah, I didn't know this, right? Yeah. Then there's the um, the whole episode of uh, the uh, staircase in New Mexico that these sisters had a guy build a chapel for them, but then he didn't really build a way to get to the upper loft except for a ladder, but that wasn't going to work. And then that guy died. So they prayed a novena to St. Joseph. Some guy shows up with just simple tools and builds this staircase and then disappears and they attributed it to saint joseph and it's still there today and it's an architectural masterpiece i mean there's no nails it almost defies gravity it's just something to see i've been there myself it's incredible mm. um i love those kind of things because we can still see them right mm -hmm. we can see the ring we can see the staircase it's amazing and then the other thing that i found amazing is that title of his that i love is he's called the terror of demons mm -hmm. Because a lot of times when you see St. Joseph in those old paintings, he's old in the shadows and he doesn't look too intimidating. And then when you hear he's called the terror of demons, you're like, whoa, that's that's the <laughs> money title. What's up with that? Why, why is this guy, you know, called that? Well, because of his parental authority with Jesus and then his powerful paternal intercession with Jesus. And the devil knows if Joseph asks Jesus for something, consider it done because Jesus loves his dad. And so the devil is terrified of that intercession of St. Joseph. And therefore we call him the terror of demons. It's, I love that. that yeah, that, that, that is a, uh, yeah, that, that is an awesome title. Um, so uh, here's one question. I don't know if you, you would know the answer to this one. So one of my favorite prayers of St. Joseph, and I don't know if this is the official title, but it's called the worker man's prayer or the, 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 the worker prayer of St. Joseph. Um, do you, do you by chance know what I'm referring to? And do you know I'd any of the, see it. Yeah, yeah, it, I'd have uh, to see it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and you know, I just wasn't sure. Uh, it, it's just, it's a, it's a beautiful prayer that I, I, I think that, um, anyone that is really just working, which is just about everybody should, should be saying that prayer daily. Um, awesome. and then we could put that in, in the description as well. Um, all right. So what about three, three lessons that men could learn from St. Joseph and also maybe three lessons that husbands could learn from St. Joseph. Yeah. If you had to. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, no, this, that's, that's kind of easy to be honest. Cause um, I love telling people, especially laymen and, and men in particular that, you know, when you think about it, the greatest um, man after Jesus um, was not a Pope was not a bishop, was not a priest. He was a layman, St. Joseph. And so that is a call to extraordinary holiness and hope for so many men who think that, well, I'm not going to become holy because I'm not a priest or I'm not. That is not true. We're all called to holiness. Mm -hmm. And St. Joseph elevates that for us, right, in a big way. And I think for all men and for husbands and fathers and for priests as well, is there's a few titles that he has that we should all look to and want to emulate and want to imitate. And that the first one that comes to mind is he's called the pillar of families. That is huge because the family is the pillar of salvation or, or the, it's the, the pillar of civilization. So when that falls down, things collapse. So we need more men to step up and to be pillars for their families, to be the ones leading the prayers, taking the family to church, taking the family to confession. That example, it can be a pillar and it, it holds up the house and, and it, it makes it strong. He's also called the glory of domestic life. Now that's amazing because we don't often think of that in reference to men, right? We're like, Hmm, the glory of domestic life. How's that work? Well, he is supposed to be pulling his weight in the home. It's not just for his wife to do everything right. Um, no, he's got to, even though he may have a job and he comes back, he needs to, 
help help do the dishes. Mm -hmm. He can help cook, you know, sometimes. He can do the things around that clean up and stuff. That is what a man is 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 called to do as well in the home. And so I think that men need to step up on that as well. Um, and then let's go back to that terror of demons title, right? Because <laughs> wouldn't it be great if men and families, husbands, fathers, priests, bishops, people looked at them and said, that man's a terror of demons. Meaning that we're super close to Jesus and though we're not his dad, like St. Joseph, we have a power of intercession because we are in love with Jesus. We're close to him. And when you're close to him, you're gonna have his ear more so than somebody who's not close to him. So imagine if people said that about us these men are terrors of demons wow <laughs> yeah now that that would be uh I, you know I'm, i was always curious as to his dynamics with mary and jesus in the house so if you just pictured like sit, them sitting around the dinner table or even joseph teaching jesus because he, he was a carpenter but i mean he also didn't he like do stuff with stone i mean he was mm -hmm. you know he so i was just always curious as to how he interacted with with our lady and and with with our lord um because in the bible i mean he is you know, obviously he's not quoted anywhere and i think it was actually you that was that i learned this from but there wasn't an encyclical written on saint joseph for quite some time so yeah. he's very silent so in my head i think of saint joseph as maybe not saying much or if he did it was very thoughtful and and meaningful which yeah probably would make sense. But what do you think his dynamic was with uh, with the Holy Family? Oh, I can. Oh, I, it must have been something because obviously he wasn't a robot. He didn't wake <laughs> up in the morning off to do my duty today. <laughs> you know, no, he he was a man. So he was he was normal. Um, I'm sure he was more reserved uh, than we are today, guarding his words and everything. But nonetheless, I mean, he had a real love for his wife. Uh, they were not in a robotic marriage. They loved each other. There was affection um, and that modeling manhood for Jesus. Mm -hmm. um, so I love to tell people this, like, um, you know, at one point Jesus says about his heavenly father, in seeing me, you have seen the father. Now, how is that? Because like father, like son, a son does what he sees his father doing. And our Lord even says that on another occasion. Well, we can say the same thing about St. Joseph. So even though Jesus doesn't look like jo St. Joseph biologically because they're not biologically linked, nonetheless, when you see Jesus, you're seeing Joseph because it was Joseph who taught him how to walk, uh, how to swing an ax, how to shave you, you know, a piece of wood. Um, and I guarantee you that Jesus, our Lord and Savior, has the accent, the mannerisms, maybe even the laugh, the way of sitting, the way of whatever of St. Joseph. So when you see Jesus on some level, you are seeing Joseph. Mm. That's extraordinary yeah, to think really about. Is. Yeah, That shows the dynamic of a real family, a real family. Yeah. Uh, you know, I was curious as to just what inspired you to, to, to write the book? I mean, did you like wake up one day and, and was like, hey, you know, <laughs> I'm just going to have, you know, just going to write this or was there things leading up to it or because it, it, the timing of it is just impeccable. I mean, you have the year of okay. St. Joseph. And then you have the, you know, the consecration of St. Joseph that launched really right around the same time. Mm. Um, and just, you just, we have, so yeah, just what, what, what inspired you? Like what, where'd yeah. that come from? So I've been a priest almost 18 years now. And a few years ago, about four years ago, I was just being bombarded with people telling me about their crisis in family living. Mm. Marriage is falling apart, children away from the faith. And I mean, I have to say the majority of people that I talked to were telling me, Father, my children don't go, to, don't go to church anymore. And I sent them to a Catholic university. And I was just hearing these horror stories. And I said to myself, you know, in prayer, it seemed to me at the root of this was a lot of father wounds. And what now you could call, and I think we're seeing it, is a certain patricide, a killing of the fathers in society, in family, even in the church, or at least a, not allowing them to, to act out their roles. So those, 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 uh, that, you know, vocation that they have to help others, to be of service to others. And therefore you get this chaos that we have everywhere. It's not the only reason, of course, but it's one of them and it's a big one. So I said to myself in prayer, man, how do we shore this thing up? How do we fix the, all this damage? And then I was like, well, duh. I mean, we've got the perfect dad, spiritual father in St. Joseph. God thought so and put him in charge of, of, of Jesus, his son and the Immaculata. Certainly we should be able to go to him to help us in this crisis. 
And that's how I came up with the idea. And then I modeled it after St. Louis de Montfort's mm -hmm. total consecration method, 33 days. And yeah, it all just came together. And the timing, like you said, I didn't know we were going to have a pandemic and all this. <laughs> no, I, but God did. And right. so he was like, okay, work on it because you don't know it. But right after you publish this, the whole world's going to shut down. Everybody's going to be in their rooms. They're going to have a lot of time to read. So, <laughs> perfect. <Right. laughs> yeah. So when you're doing the research for it, um, you know, you're, you're talking about the, uh, the miracle in, in New Mexico, but was there, what would you say is like one of the most famous or maybe even surprising apparitions of St. Joseph, as well as maybe the, you know, uh, a miracle that is outside of the, the, the one you talked about in New Mexico? Yeah. So miracle wise, I mean, there's a, it was, I think it was in the 16th century or the 17th century, might've been the 17th century in France, there was a young boy who was shepherding sheep and um, isn't that always the case? It's always young yeah, kids, almost sheep in a field, you know? Um, so Joseph came to him and he, the boy was really uh, thirsty because it was, it was a hot day. And this man appeared to him that he didn't know was Joseph at first. And he told him to pick up this huge boulder and he would find water. That's always a constant theme too. And, and he was like, I can't do that, sir. I can't, I'm just a boy, you know? But he said, no, pick it up and move it. So he did. And it was, I mean, extraordinary. So he went back to the village and all these men came back and they saw where the big boulder had been moved. And then it took 10 men to move it a little further. And then the, the kid was like, that was Joseph. I know it was Joseph. So that's an incredible thing. And that spot is still there. It's approved and people go there on pilgrimage. But one of the ones that's extraordinary as well and kind of forgotten or neglected is that St. Joseph appeared at Fatima. Mm. You know, um, we always just think about Our Lady and primarily so, of course. But on that last apparition, October 13th, the famous one, right, where the sun was gyrating and people thought it was going to collide with the earth. And well, the three children saw St. Joseph holding the Christ child and together, father and son, Joseph and Jesus blessed the world. I think that's huge because I think I don't think we're going to get the triumph of the Immaculate Heart of Mary, which we're all wanting and praying for these days, big time um, until we get the family right. We got to bring back the important role of the father and families and his blessing and and all of that um, in order to experience Our Lady's triumph, I, I think. Yeah, and I'm wondering with that, so, you, you know, I have a, a similar, uh, maybe, I don't know if hunch or theory is, is the right word, but that, yeah, that that men, we, we let our guard down. And, and I also look at the church. So if I was Satan, I would do two things. Uh, I would attack the church and I'd attack the family. And both have been attacked, like, yeah. bad. Um, and I just, I don't know like how we got here. And then the, the remedy I think is what you're saying is just, we have, you know, let's model ourselves for the men after, after St. Joseph. Um, but when I look around, I mean, it's, it's bad. Like it's, it's really, really bad. And so a lot of it, there's not, there doesn't seem to be a lot of hope. Of course there is hope and our hope is in, in Jesus, but I'm just curious, like how, how did we get to the spot and maybe my, my viewpoint of history is bad, but how do we get to the spot that we're in? Because it's, yeah, it's, I mean, you know, it's, it's bad. No, it is brother. You're not exaggerating. You're right. Um, I, I mean, I've studied church history and things and yes, there have been other times where things were really, really bad, but right now I, I think it's the worst it's ever been because we've got the Holocaust of abortion. Yeah. We've got contraception. We've got people thinking that gay marriage is fine and legit. Right. And, and so many Catholics, I mean, look at the way that they approve of these things, the way that they vote today. I mean, we're in a serious situation. And that's across the board in the Catholic Church. From the top down, we've got serious problems. And so I think, obviously, at the root of this is, like St. Paul says, we're in a spiritual battle. Um, and who is the devil? And this is the thing that is amazing to me. It came to me in prayer some months ago after the book was published. Well, we call him, or, or actually Jesus called him, the father of lies. So he's got a certain fatherhood. Hmm. He hates the fatherhood of God and he hates the fatherhood of St. Joseph and all fatherhood, but he's like a monkey, right? He just imitates, he mocks, he mimics like, a, like an ape in the zoo. He can't create anything himself. Therefore, he tries to take what is somebody else's and, and do something with it. So he's, he's a father, but it's a deceptive, manipulative. He's out to harm you and hurt you. And so he has had a field day in society and in the church with jacking up fatherhood. I mean, we've seen this across the board. I mean, more than half of all marriages today end in divorce. And in most instances, not all, it's the man who wants the divorce. 
Mm. Um, in the church, we've seen messed up fatherhood of guys wearing one of these. We've seen the scandals on TV. We've heard the horrific things that have happened sinfully and criminally. So we've got to go back to restoring fatherhood, both in, in the hierarchy, in the church, in the clergy, and in families. This is one of the ways we're going to get out of this mess. Do, do you have any advice? Because sometimes, you know, you'll, you'll, at least I will, read too much of the news or, or watch too much of the news. Then you start thinking of things and you just go down to this like really dark <laughs> place. Yeah, but there is right. hope, you know. So mm-hmm. do you have any advice to yeah. the people that are just on the brink of despair? Um, you know, like what kind of, I guess, comforting words could, yeah. could, you, could you say when you think about everything that's, that's going on? Yeah, I mean, as long as we've got a pulse, we've got hope, right? So yeah. it's not over yet, and we know who wins in the end right. anyway, but that doesn't mean we're not going to suffer for a time in this valley of tears. So we've got to definitely take advantage of um, the timeout that's been given us. I mean, in a certain sense, uh, you know, I don't think that God planned for people to be dying you know, in the situation that we're in, but he did allow it, and he's allowing the lockdowns, um, you know, oftentimes you question them. You're like, is this really necessary? Do we really need all these restrictions and all this crazy stuff? I, I, I seriously doubt that myself, but we can take advantage of it by getting our spiritual lives back. So many people would say to me prior to this, Father, I just don't have time to pray. I'm so busy. I work nine to five. I got to take the kids to, to, you know, baseball practice. I've got this and then this. Now, nobody is saying this. You can't say this. It's not happening. <laughs> right. So you've got plenty of time to pray and to get your spiritual life corrected and realign things properly. And I've met a lot of people that have done that. I have, and it's fantastic. Families now are praying together um, and, and, and kind of rediscovering each other because of this. Now there's gonna be rub of course, cause you know, you're gonna realize, wow, I didn't know they had those idiosyncrasies. This is odd, you know? <laughs> yeah. um, well, that's where you learn to be merciful, right. to be patient, you know? And so we've got to take advantage of the time we're given because that's all we got right now. Um, and like you said, maybe turn off the media, the news, it's just constantly recycling the same garbage. Um, and it will get you depressed. You got to watch it every now and then, but you don't need to be at 24 seven. It, it will bum you out for sure. <laughs> right. So. Yeah. There was a, uh, there was a, um, on census fidelium, which is a YouTube channel. We, I was listening to a talk by, and I forget the guy's, the, the, the father's name. It was great, but the title was essentially saying that no 2020, was a really good year if you look at it in the perspective of there was a lot of opportunities to suffer um and that is the currency for heaven so you can't avoid it and so there was there was plenty of opportunities to suffer uh last year um and you know another silver lining might be the education system as well is is taking i mean public schools are not teaching you know (laughs) catholic morality I, i would say uh but, you know, a lot of people are going to, to homeschooling. Um, yeah. So yeah. that is another silver lining that, that has happened. Yeah. True. Uh, I mean, that is very true. And, you know, it, it, it is crazy because you're right. The, I mean, the public school system these days is dangerous. The things that they're advocating and, and teaching and the things that they're doing even behind the parents' backs. Um, that is what is going on here. So there's an agenda at work. Um, and yet at the same time, yeah, families are kind of tightening up, you know, themselves because they do realize, and thank God, even a lot of fathers are realizing this now, there are threats out there against my wife and against my children. And I need to shore this thing up and protect those that I love against all of these things because I'm hearing more and more about this every day. You know, some new curriculum is approved in California and I'm like, what? You know, it's like, to to seven-year-olds? I mean, it's unbelievable. It's bad. And, you know, I thought it was bad I don't know if that's me just being an old man, you know, like you have like the old, old, like, oh, it was so bad. Or, you know, I, it was great back in the day, but I really think like, so I was born in 82. And so in high school, I was in the nineties and, you know, there was some significant stuff going on, but it just seems like it's, mm. it's a whole new level. I mean, would you agree with that? Cause I mean, you, you know, I, yeah. I mean, it just seems yeah. like it uh, has really escalated. No, no, without a doubt. Yeah. I mean, even back in the day when I was living a crazy, sinful life, I knew that I didn't belong in a woman's bathroom. That was obvious to me, even though I I, I probably would have liked to have been back then because I, you know, I had my own issues. But all my friends knew 
any dude who wants to do that is a perv. I mean, you got issues. Today, you got a right to do it. <laughs> right. I mean, yeah, things are real bad. <laughs> okay. All right, so it's just not me. I just wanted to make sure. Uh, <laughs> no. uh, you know, so going back to St. Joseph, um, and within the Bible, actually it was from this book, The Life and Glories of St. Joseph, but there was a quote that I just wanted to read real quick because it, it really came out um, because he's, he was referred to as just. And so, I was, you know, it, the the, um, the author was talking about, you know, what 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 all is contained in that word. Um, and so and it was St. Jerome. And this is what St. Jerome said. He said, Joseph is called just on account of having possessed all virtues in a perfect degree. The word justice in face comprehends every virtue in as much as it leads man to render to each his due, which is to God, to his neighbor, and to himself. And when that debt faithfully discharged, what else is wanting to true perfection? So when I read that, you know, just the word, ju so rendering on to someone what is due. So St. Joseph perfectly rendered on to everyone, God, neighbor, family, perfectly he, he rendered on to them what was what was due so that mm -hmm. that to me i don't know it just kind of it just kind of struck me because i never really focused too much on really why was that term even right. uh in the bible out of all the terms that could have been referencing saint joseph why was it just you know why yeah, was that? it's true so, no it's a good point because you could think yeah why didn't they say he was a, the humblest of all men or he was the whatever which is true but yeah that word i think just is because it definitely has a relationship to God. Mm -hmm. So he gave God his due. And so our first order of justice is that. And then it comes to giving others on our same level their due, right? So when you are willing to give God his due, it means that you're willing to um, participate in the practices of your, your holy religion. So for, for, for Joseph, that would have meant walking to the temple three times a year to Jerusalem participating in all the festivities and celebrations of, of, of the Jewish religion. He was just, he gave God worship. He, he sacrificed his time and all that stuff to be with God. For us now, you know, the fulfillment of Judaism and Christianity, specifically Catholicism, that means that we have to give God his due by going to mass. Mm -hmm. Now, right now I know with the pandemic, there's restrictions and everything. So it's understood if we're limited according to where you live, but in the normal course of things, we have to give God this. And when we do not give God his due, which means to worship and adore him, we are not acting justly towards God. And that I think is a huge thing for many men to think about. Because I can't tell you how many people I, I meet in marriages and it's, it's the woman who's the religious one and not the father, not the husband. But he needs to be just. He needs to give God his due. And that requires sacrifice. It's yeah. not always pleasant to wake up at 7 a.m. on a Sunday. Ha, I'll be the first to admit <laughs> it, right? It's not. We're human beings. We get lazy. We want to sleep in under the warm blankets. Okay, we get it, right? But it requires sacrifice. And that's where your manhood is tested and proven. And that's why so many of us, we need to man up and we need to be more like St. Joseph. Yeah, and he perfect. It said, you know, he perfectly did that, which was just amazing. So in terms of justice is to say, you know, a married man, what would be perfect justice to the your wife? I mean, what so what is that? Right. You know, if, if I was trying to uh, use St. Joseph as an example to what, you know, his interaction with Mary, yeah. um, you know, I could picture him putting her on the donkey and him walking, you know, he's not, he's not on the donkey, obviously. Um, <laughs> right, you know, right. yeah. I, I just have this, just this noble man, this, this justful man. And just, so, yeah. I, you know, I, I guess my question is how in, in relation to Joseph and Mary, yeah. what could, you know, um, what could we learn with, with our wives? Uh, yeah. how, how do we model that? Well, I think, um, you know, there's a giving her her due is to recognize her dignity, her worth and to treat her as such. Mm -hmm. So because I meet a lot of people again who they say, well, I'm married, so I get to do with my wife's body, whatever I want to do because we're married. No, you're not an animal, you know, and you have to treat her with dignity and respect. You have to do things according to natural law um, that are pleasing to God. And so 
that is is huge because I, I can tell you today, so many men just simply use their wife's body for their pleasurable purposes, and then they just you know on with their day. This is not how marriage is is meant to be. Um, you have to respect her. You have to treat her right, um, and you have to allow yourself to cooperate with her because the the another danger, and this is where so many women have been wounded by men, is they've abused their strength, whether emotionally, physically, or worse. Right? Every family needs the head and the heart. Mm -hmm. And simply because a man is called the head of the family, which everybody today gets triggered on, they're like, oh, that's not politically correct. Look, it's in the Bible. I didn't make this stuff up. It's <laughs> just how a God messenger. Set it up. Yeah, right. So it's, and it's not saying that men are better than women, because in all, you know, in most cases, for real, we're not. Okay. The majority of the people at the foot of the cross were not men, they were women. The greatest woman or human person who ever lived was not a man because Jesus is a divine person, the greatest human person who ever lived was a woman, Our Lady, right, the Immaculata. So, but a man has to cooperate with his wife and listen to her and, and, and be guided with her guidance because a woman's intuition is incredible, right, into the raising of the children and, and all of that. And a wife, as it says in Ephesians about Christ and the church, she should also, you know, as it says, be submissive. And that's, again, where people freak out, you know, we're not talking about cavemen here. <laughs> Woman, make me breakfast. That's not, we're not, we're talking about how Christ loves the church and how Joseph loved Mary, right? That complementarity, not competition. And therefore you give each other their due. So a wife gives the husband due when he allows her, when she allows him to lead, right? Because he's strong and to protect them. When she tries to take that role from him, it's not giving her husband his due. And the husband gives her, his wife, uh, her due when he allows her feminine genius, because it's definitely there, to be in full display and to make everything beautiful and lovely, that's what a woman does. Mm -hmm. If it were just up to us men, <laughs> you know, we'd all be living in frat houses. It'd, it'd be a disaster. <laughs> you know, <laughs> right? You need both. And when you give each other that, it's a beautiful dance. It's a beautiful thing to witness. I've seen it in so many families. It's lovely. What about with with children? So. You know, I'm, I'm trying to think of St. Joseph as, uh, you know, he didn't have to discipline Jesus in, in that right. sense, you know. But, you know, what 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 could, what does justice look like in relation from husbands to the children? Yeah, I mean, that it is a little tricky in that instance because you're right. I mean, it's not like he had to tell Jesus, you know, don't do this. I mean, he was a right. perfect kid. You know, he's, a, geez, he's God. Um, so that that di dynamic is different. However... I mean, you do have to, as, as you know, you often hear today, especially in relationships to moms, there's that helicopter mom where she's just hovering over and she gives no ability to exercise your free will whatsoever. You know, you will play here for the next 10 minutes with my eyes on you. You will do nothing fun. You know, you're just, no, you have to allow them to have, to be children. You know, what is the pro one of the big problems today is people just medicate kids simply for being kids. And so they say, oh, he's just so excited all the time. He's a kid. Okay, maybe maybe there could be some medical diagnosis if this is some extreme case, not you know, saying that couldn't be the case, of course. But you've got to give the kid his due and allow him to grow up, you know, to 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 express himself in various ways. And that's just how you can't like if you're if your child is is crying or screaming, you don't muffle their voice and, and suffocate them. It's going to happen. OK, let the child be a child. There's a certain giving them their due of just growing up through a process. If they fall and hurt themselves, it's part of the process. You know, it, 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 it's how it happens. So there's a certain dynamic there at work that um, you, you have to allow for this kind of growth and development. Um, and by giving them, you know, the, that, that freedom to, to do it and not not treating them like an animal. Uh, on a leash. I mean, I've seen parents who have their kids on a leash. Have you seen this? Uh, yeah, I've kidding. seen some. Yeah, I've seen it in malls and stuff. And I'm just like, what does that say to the kids? I've also, I've also seen it. I've also seen adults. <laughs> with, with yeah, adults. that's true. That's true. Yeah, well, well, we're a messed up culture for sure. But uh, yeah, so maybe their intentions are good, but it's just <laughs> you're not a dog, you know? Right. Well, you know, and also providing, you know, for for the kids. I think, you know, a, a child deserves, I, I would think, to be provided for because they can't provide for themselves. And then also right. with work, you know, I, I wouldn't think that um, because that could be slothful. I mean, overworking could be sloth. You know, you're, you're, yeah. you're not doing what you ought to do. 
So I would oh, think, I good. mean, do you think that St. Joseph would just even like with, with his job, I mean, he probably had a, a, a time to like, it was his time to go home and, and be, be with his family. So he probably managed yes. his time well, I would think, right? Oh, you, you got a great insight there because one thing that he was not, and I mentioned this in my book, is he was not a workaholic. Right, that is not going to benefit you or your family or society. There's a time to work and there's a time not to work. Mm -hmm. And so, if he's just, as you said, in all avenues and you know the got it to the superlative degree, he did. He wasn't a slacker, but he also wasn't a workaholic. And though men toward tend to gravitate towards one or the other, we tend to just be like, eh, <laughs> or I'm going to go for. It. I'm going to get that trophy. Nope, I'm going to crush all my opponents, right? Well, you got to take time out <laughs> and you got to be with your wife and your kids. We talk, it's a silly cliche, the quality time, but it's actually true. Is that, you is that hard for a priest? I mean, because you're, you're mm. on call like all the time. So yep. like, how do you it do is. that? And how, I mean, cause you, you need to rest, you know? Yeah. So no, it is, it is very hard. And a lot of times people don't understand that. And so they don't understand Oh, here we are again. It's Tuesday night at the men's meeting and father isn't here. What a slacker. <laughs> and it's like, um, I've been up since six doing stuff all day. You guys, your job ends at 5 p.m. I got to go to the hospital or I got to do this. So a lot of people can be really hard on priests in that sense of, uh, you know, he's not, you know, doing everything. I can't buy locate, you know. Um, so, yeah, it can be very hard for us because we don't have a, a punch in and punch out time. Mm -hmm. um, it's all the time, 24 seven, 365. I mean, yeah, it's challenging. So we have to take time for ourselves or we will burn out. Yeah, yeah, I could I could definitely see that. Um, you know, I really only have one, you've answered all my questions and we're close to the top of the hour, but just the, the very last one I had, uh, and I, could, I probably could think of like five more, but just um, going back to the Bible and St. Joseph, and was there any significance as to why he was not recorded saying anything in the Bible. I, I just find that just how significant of a, of a man he was, you would think, but I guess you could say that with Mary. I mean, there's not too many recorded, you know, and, and she is the uh, uh -huh. queen of heaven, but is there, have you meditated on that? Or like, I'm just trying to understand why, what is there, what's the significance of him not being recorded yeah. too much? Well, or, I think, I, I mean, just maybe practically speaking, probably because Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John didn't know him, right? Whereas they met Mary. I mean, mm -hmm. she stuck around. She, the, you know, God had her hang around for the beginning of the church. None of the writers of the Gospels ever met Joseph. So, and as a matter of fact, this is, this is what's fascinating to me. How did Joseph end up really getting into the New Testament at, at all, therefore, if they didn't know him? Well, who was it that would have told them, Matthew, Luke, about Joseph? Well, it was Mary. Mm -hmm. It had to be. And there's actually tons of saints, and there's a strong tradition that talks about this, that it was Mary bringing Joseph into the New Testament, saying, yes, let me tell you about the time when we went to Jerusalem and we lost him. And Joseph and I were so worried, and we went back, and three days later we found him, and I said, why did you do this to your father and I? Right? That's how Joseph got in, because Matthew and Luke were clueless about this stuff. They had no idea that this, these things happened. So... I love the fact that that it's Mary who actually has talked about her husband, and he's the reason he's in the New Testament. Um, I find those kind of things fascinating to think about, right? Yeah, no, that that yeah, that me too. So I, I think that that wraps it up, Father. Um, so for the book, so where where could you know if people wanted to consecrate themselves to Saint Joseph, where would they go? Uh, purchase the book and the art. I'm, I'm telling you that you got to look at this this commissioned art that you had. Yeah, it's fantastic. No, Actually, for, I'm going to probably buy some here after this uh, this call. But where, yeah, where can really, they go? They're really popular. So we have a um, my religious community set up a website just for for the book. So the book is Consecration to Saint Joseph. The website is just Consecration to Saint Joseph org. So super easy. And we got the paperback, of course. But then there's the ebook, the audio book. It's in Spanish as well. And uh, that's where you'll find um, the art, like you said. So consecration yeah. to stjoseph.org. And that's S-T, right? Not saint spelled out. That's right. Just yeah. S-T. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you again for your time, Father. And thank you for all that you do for, for the church. And we're, uh, we're definitely in gratitude to you. So thank you, Father. Thanks, my brother. God bless you. And keep up the great work at TAN. You guys are awesome. Oh, thank you. We'll try. Mm -hmm. All right.